Welcome back everyone here, day three of the European Sustainable Energy Week. It's so good to be back here in the Gaspari Room, the European Commission in Brussels. But also, of course, welcome to you all watching online. Day three, the final day of this week, this amazing week. Yesterday we had a really exciting day uh, with, uh, of course, starting off with uh, two big thematic blocks, uh, the energy efficiency and also inclusion and affordability. And at the end of the day, um, uh, I at least saw a part of the Manage Energy talk, which was uh, very inspiring. Uh, and I'm sure many of you thought the same. Now, we also did a survey. We ran a survey throughout the building. Uh, probably many of you have also participated to get to know you a little bit better, who's in the room. And we've got some interesting results. We, amongst other things, asked, uh, how did you get interested into sustainable energy? And most of you answered either from uh, personal experiences, but also from environmental concerns. So there's a lot of people with a particular passion, but also a concern that brought you here to discuss the future of renewable energy. And also another interesting thing that we found was that uh, most people in this room are, uh, and also watching by the way, are between 35 and 46. But the next group, the youngsters are already knocking on the doors because the next biggest group is, between, is aged between 25 and 35. So the next generation of climate leaders is also here uh, with us today. Now it's the final day, but we're uh, not far, uh, we're far from the end, I should say, because we have a fantastic lineup of sessions uh, with all sorts of policymakers, industry representatives, uh, and civil society here with us. And we're going to address some of the pressing questions today again, such as what is the role of offshore wind energy in securing our energy security? How do we diversify our energy supply? And how do we do so in an international setting? How do we really decarbonize uh, our whole economy, not just in Europe, but really in the rest of the world as well? So today we've got lined up 24 policy sessions. 12 in the morning on renewables and 12 in the afternoon on international energy systems and decarbonization. And again, everything will be streamed, uh, so feel free to re-watch anything that you want later on uh, in the couple of weeks and months to follow. I'd also like to remind you that today it is the final day, so we'll have a closing ceremony that's going to happen at 5.30. And that'll be with the young ambassadors, the 30 young ambassadors that you saw uh, at day one. They will present their ideas they've been working on on the Tuesday uh, evening, uh, together with also none other than the head of cabinet of, uh, exec of um, Euro Commissioner Frans Timmermans and also the DG for Energy, uh, Director General for Energy, Ditte Jul Jurgensen. So they are going to close this ceremony together with uh, two representatives from the young ambassadors. And thereafter, to really celebrate also this week, we're going to have a networking cocktail with hopefully a lot of you as well. So that's going to happen at six o'clock. Uh, now, if you're watching online, uh, feel free to join any session that you want. All of the policy sessions are indeed streamed. So just go to the interactive program and there you can click on the right session to follow uh, the session you like. The policy sessions will all be run in English. Um, but indeed, also feel free to network with any of the participants online using the chat and the video call functionalities. Um, if you haven't done so, visit the Energy Fair. That's really what I uh, also have to recommend that you really have to see because there's still many inspiring projects that you can hopefully also uh, get acquainted with. Um, last but not least, Wi-Fi codes. Just as a quick reminder for anyone who needs it, uh, we're going to put it up here on the screen, I believe. The EC Guest Network, join it if you need it. Now, moving on to the most interesting part of uh, this morning. Um, that is going to be the first keynote speaker. Uh, she's going to introduce the first two thematic blocks of today. As I said, it's all going to be about renewables and international systems. 
what can we expect from the further rollout of renewables, from measures advancing the Europe's Green Deal, and what about the COP28 summit later this year in Dubai? This and much more will be discussed in today's keynote speech, which will be delivered by Cristina Lobilio Berrero. She works at the European Commission DG for Energy as the director of the Energy Platform Task Force. Now she's going to kick off the day and introduce these two themes for you. Can you please get a warm hand for Cristina Lobilio? <laughs> Good morning uh, to all and welcome to the third and last day of the EU Sustainable Energy Week. We are very pleased today to have you all with us in a day of very exciting discussions. We have a very rich program ahead of us uh, with a wide range of topics to be covered today, from grids and markets to renewables and hydrogen. We will touch upon key policy development, such as the Green Deal Industrial Plan, or the update of the national uh, energy and climate plans in the European Union. We hope that you all will find these conversations uh, useful, inspiring, and uh, enlightening. To kickstart this day, uh, I will give you an overview of the international energy environment, Europe has been navigating the last year, and more uh, precisely since the, the invasion of uh, Ukraine, on a very uh, critical situation in the energy sector. Uh, let us start by, by this point, by the invasion of Ukraine and uh, the implications for the energy sector. The last year, a very, very few days after the unprovoked invasion of Ukraine by Russia, uh, the European Council endorsed the Repower EU. Repower EU was our answer to um, the, the war in, in Ukraine. Uh, with our Repower strategy, since May the last year, we have been first diversifying and replacing the energy supplies from Russia towards more reliable suppliers. We have also adopted storage obligations that member states and companies have fulfilled. So we can now start the nest filling season with a high level of over 55% of our gas storage capacity. Um, this is a very a reliable uh, figure just to make sure that we have security of supply in the European Union. But we have also uh, speed up the clean energy transition. We have proposed higher targets for both renewables and energy efficiency to meet the climate goals. We are making it faster and less complex to acquire permits to um, invest in renewable projects in the European Union. And we are giving a huge push to invest more in solar energy. This led to a record year for the energy transition in Europe. In 2022, the EU deployed more renewables than ever, with about 55 gigawatts of new renewables added to the grid, of which 16 gigawatts of wind and 41 gigawatts of solar. In addition, the European Union has seen the best improvement of energy efficiency in its history, with an 8% decrease in energy intensity of the EU economy. This goes uh, beyond demand reduction induced by the prices and the effect of a very mild winter. The International Energy Agency estimates that even without accounting for this, energy intensity still improved by 4%, still another record in the European Union. Let me um, focus now on the EU energy platform. The last April, the EU energy platform was launched with the objective of helping to replace Russian gas supplies. The platform had three main missions. The first one 
to set up a mechanism for demand aggregation and joint uh, purchase of gas. Second, to improve uh, the efficiency of the use of the existing infrastructure in the European Union and also to conduct the international outreach to gas suppliers. I will start by this uh, third point. In terms of coordinated international outreach, we have uh, done significant actions vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, other suppliers that, as I was mentioning before, are more reliable than Russia. This um, includes, um, in the first um, point, our relation with the US, um, not only with the administration, but also with companies, uh, together to have um, Russian gas replaced by US LNG. We created the EU-US Task Force, and um, I want to share with you a figure, because thanks to all the work that we have with the administration and with the US LNG producers, the last year we achieved um, 50 BCM, billion cubic meters of American LNG gas in the European Union, compared to 21 in the, um, 2021. Another meaningful development in, this, uh, in that um, uh, sense was the signature of a trilateral memorandum of understanding between the European Union, Israel, and Egypt. This, is, this memorandum of understanding is related to the transport and export of gas to the European Union, but also we signed with Egypt an MOU on the green hydrogen for the future. For the sake of completeness, we are also working with pipeline suppliers to the European Union. Um, President von der Leyen and President Aliyev in Azerbaijan, they signed an MOU the last 18th of July. And um, a task force was also created to work with Norway. And we have also intensified our high level dialogue with Algeria. The European Union has also established a number of forward-looking partnerships with her countries, uh, for instance, um, on critical raw materials that are essential for the development of green technologies in the European Union, and also for the future renewable hydrogen market in the European Union and in the world. I want to mention some of the countries with whom we have signed this MOU, Namibia, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, and we are also working in the development of green partnership that were signed with Japan, Korea, and Morocco. This agreement aims to ensure that Europe has a diversified supply of raw material and refined products that are needed for the energy transition in the medium and longer term. Let me now give you some information about the security of supply and energy outlook. As a result of this in international outreach, there are no immediate security of supply concerns. But we remain very vigilant, and we must be prepared for the next winter without Russian gas. We reach the high level of storage filling ahead of the winter, uh, with the European Union reach a level of 95%, which is above the target set in the gas storage regulation. But as I was mentioning, we need to remain vigilant because we also experience a volatility in the gas prices in the last days, even if the gas price has now um, decreased and is very close to pre-war levels. But again, we have to remain vigilant. Let me now uh, focus on the joint uh, purchase of gas. That is um, it's an experience that has been, has been done in the European Union for the first time. Uh, the solidarity regulation that was adopted by the Council of Ministers the last December is the legal basis for this um, joint uh, purchase mechanism. Uh, it's important to, uh, to stress that the mechanism that we have proposed is interesting in one side for the suppliers who uh, seek a bigger demand and bigger market to place their gas offer, but also for the companies who aggregate demand to get direct access to a wide spectrum of suppliers and also to obtain competitive uh, prices. The mechanism has two-step approach. The first one, demand aggregation. The platform allows uh, companies located in member states and energy community contracting parties, the Western Balkans plus Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, to express the gas demand. 
Moreover, all member states in the European Union should make sure that their companies submit to demand aggregation a volume that is equivalent to 15% to the gas needed to refill gas storage in the European Union for the winter 2023-2024. This is around 13.5 BCM. Uh, this is the only compulsory uh, element that we have in, in our regulation. The second um, element is the voluntary purchase of gas. Once uh, the demand has been matched with supply, the companies are free to negotiate and conclude contracts with gas suppliers. This contracting phase uh, will be carried out outside of the Commission and the platform that we engage to this purpose, that is called Aggregate EU. The commercial relations happen between companies with no um, uh, any, any kind of involvement of the European Commission. But obviously the Commission will follow the conclusion of all this contract and also uh, to, to, to make sure that this contract also contribute to the security of supply in the European Union. The joint purchasing mechanism is particularly beneficial for smaller companies and companies from landlocked countries with less global outreach or negotiating power. This will allow also for more clients to come to the LNG market and to replace the pipeline gas from Russia. The result of the first round of tenders is uh, quite impressive. Uh, there are so far over 135 companies, both buyers or sellers, who subscribe to aggregate EU. And in the first round, we were able to see a demand of 11.6 billion cubic meters, and the supply uh, offers um, was around 18.7 BCM, leading to a 10.9 BCM of demand being actually matched and under the process of the different um, contract. We are uh, in the Commission, in the DNR, in very close contact with companies. Uh, now that in this process of um, negotiating contract, and we are now preparing the second tender that will be launched the 26th of June, so the next Monday. We have started this uh, platform uh, to, as I was mentioning, to replace Russian gas, but in the regulation, the solitary regulation, uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen, is also considered as um, future scope for joint purchase in the future. So. Um, after this experience on LNG, we'll also work on renewable hydrogen under a mechanism of joint purchase. Allow me now to focus on COP28. The COP28 is one of the most important events in the European Union and in the world, obvious, obviously, but a big priority for the European Union. And, um, and here, obviously, we continue to work towards the long-term objective of climate neutrality by 2050 that is, as you all know, enshrined in our EU climate law adopted in 2021. This year, uh, following the formal uh, conclusion of the FIFA 55, still some files uh, with our co-legislators, the European Union will be in a position to update as appropriate the national determined contribution to the Paris Agreement of the European Union and uh, its member states. The context for the COP28 is extremely challenging as parties have made little progress on mitigation ambition and we are at risk of not keeping the 1.5 degrees objective of the Paris Agreement within reach. We need an ambitious outcome at COP28. We also need to make headway in our work to align the global financial flows to global climate needs and the ongoing summit for a new global financial pact in Paris is currently discussing that. The global stock take is the main event for COP28 this year and will reveal both the ambition and the implementation gaps in a way that should drive more actions in the world. But the global stock take also carried a risk that parties begin to focus on the next round of national determined contributions and the new finance goal, and not what remains to be done now in the current uh, decade. This initiative would also contribute to create a new political momentum for ambitious action on energy and climate at the global level. 
evidence shows that the work is not on track for the 1.5 uh, degrees trajectory as per the Paris Agreement. Based on our EU modeling, current policies would lead to a temperature increase of at least three degrees by mid-century. This would lead to dramatic uh, consequences on the climate and on the planet and its environment, ecosystem, and of course, on our human societies everywhere around the globe. As you know, the energy transition is and will continue to be the main vector of decarbonization at global level, especially in this decade and the next one. In short, we all need to do more and fast. For that, the world needs a common horizon, a common ambition. The Paris Agreement gives a concrete objective when it comes to temperature decrease and greenhouse gas emissions, but not as regards how to get there. In particular, there is no um, universally agreed pathway for a global energy transition in line with the 1.5 objective of the Paris Agreement. In substance, we need to know and to agree on what in line with the Paris Agreement means to for the two principal tools that we can use to decarbonize the energy sector, rene renewable energy and energy efficiency. This is why the last 20th of April, the president of the commission at the major economies forum, she announced that the European Union will support the idea of setting global targets for renewable energy and energy efficiency. This initiative aimed to mobilize all countries around these two essential level of energy transition. This will be discussed throughout the year and officially launched at COP28 in Dubai in the form of global pledges. In recent weeks, the commission has worked intensively with international um, organization, in particular the International Energy Agency and IRENA to gather the data and models that we need to bring the world's energy transition in line with the 1.5 trajectory. Evidence shows the following. For renewables, we need to triple the global rate of deployment of renewables between now and 2030. And on energy efficiency, we need to double the global rate of energy efficiency improvement this decade and also with a view to phase out fossil fuels in the world. In the coming months, the European Union, together with the like-minded partners, will reach out to other countries to ensure as many countries that this objective is reached in uh, the COP28. As a conclusion, I would like to highlight how exceptional the last uh, 18 months in the European Union have been for all of us with a full war of aggression on our continent and a global energy crisis. The European Union did not sacrifice the Green Deal for the energy security. On the contrary, the European Union has speed up the energy transition with higher targets and uh, more um, and high action on the, uh, to achieve the target that were agreed very recently. This is why uh, we need also in the European Union to lead by the example, to comply with our Paris Agreement objectives. But it is also essential to ensure our energy security. If the war in Ukraine and uh, the energy crisis prove anything, is that for the Euro European Union in particular, renewable energy efficiency, renewable hydrogen are absolutely key to the energy security equation as well. For us to deliver on these ambitious objectives, everyone must play its part. Policymakers at all levels, from the local to the European level, but also regulators, industrial players, uh, companies, and consumers. All are present in today's event, in this uh, sustainable week, and I hope that your conversations uh, today will give you the tools to contribute at your level to this exciting endeavor that is the decarbonization of our economy in the European Union. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a productive and inspiring day of exchanges. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cristina Lobilio, for uh, this introduction indeed on today's themes, renewables and international systems and decarbonization.
Uh, there is lots to be done. I'm happy to hear that indeed we are slaying record after record in the EU. But I also hear that still lots is to be done, that we're not making the 1.5 uh, reduction or uh, maximum uh, climate heating targets that we should. So there's plenty to be done. And today, hopefully, we can make the next step of, of realizing those uh, emission reduction targets. We're going to dive deeper uh, into energy storage systems right here in the Gaspari rooms in just a few minutes. And if you want to see more also of uh, Director Lubilio, at 2 o'clock she'll be back here uh, during a session on national energy and climate and recovery and resilience plans. Uh, for now, I wish you all the best and enjoy your last day. Thank you.